Hello and welcome to our lecture on database architectures. So if you've uh, taken any classes from me, you've seen this slide um, whenever I talk about relational databases, whether it's MySQL or SQLite or even Postgres in an earlier class. Um, every time I give this slide, there's this little, little part inside of me that like sort of breaks my heart because I'm trying in the beginning to give you a set of rules that are simple and easy to understand and database normalization is a very hard concept and so I'm I'm oversimplifying here this this notion of don't replicate data is most of the time uh, and the reason I just in the beginning say it's all the time is because most people when they first start out don't need to know that you don't you can replicate data if you feel like it um, because it's not true you don't replicate data if you feel like it but sometimes you are forced by the size of your application and the scale of your application to do the replication. And so it's usually true, and I'll honestly say 95 out of 100 times that people say, you know, I'm just going to replicate data. They're doing it for the wrong reason, and that's because they're being lazy, and they're not really trying, and they don't want to understand uh, data normalization. So don't replicate data until you fully understand uh, database normalization. So a lot of this evolving database architecture is captured in the sort of NoSQL movement. You know, is SQL the right answer or is there something else? Is there something that is better than SQL that's going to be super cool and whatever? And there is so much in technology, this sort of wheel of what's new. Uh, some people like say it's, uh, it's this tech circle where you just rediscover something they did 15 years ago. And so NoSQL in a way is kind of like just storing stuff on disk rather than in a database, which of course is also on disk, but storing stuff in files. And, you know, honestly, in 1996, we wrote a lot of web applications that did nothing but store everything in files, and then we realized they didn't scale and for things like transactions and money, etc. You just couldn't do it in files because you're rewriting the whole file too often, and then you start writing indexing. You know, it's like, and then you need transactions. So, so there's no SQL in a sense was a movement that kind of came in, you know, 2010, 2013. It says like SQL is bad. It's too constricting. Look at this cool thing I found. And the answer is no, we all found that 20 years ago. And then we decided it wasn't such a bad idea. So this is really not the right question is whether or not SQL is a good idea or not. Because SQL is just like a, a shape. It's a, it's a syntax that we use to communicate. Uh, a better question almost is whether or not it's relational you know is this a set of rows and columns and against the relational to remember is at the connection between a row and a column that's the relationship not just rows and columns that's a spreadsheet is rows and columns is it that or are there a set of documents when with key value pairs in those documents and that is the non-relational way of thinking about it that they're not really columns there's sort of one blob of text. Inside that blob of text, there's a whole bunch of key value pairs. And these days, this isn't even a good sort of way to split the market. Really, the way to split the market, I think, in a healthy way, is to use the term acid or base. This is the best question to ask, and it is a question that is more about the underlying truth of how databases work and less about the syntax of it or the storage tricks that happen to be used by it and so it, so let's this is nice a nice true technical difference between some of the old traditional databases like uh, postgres and the new databases like mongo or cassandra and so let's look at the acid and the base um, acronyms they're both a little bit contrived, although the acid is much older. The base is sort of like uh, a more recently convenient thing. So acid stands for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. It can really be summed up with these databases go to great extents to ensure that if there is some value at a row column thing that has a 42. And if anyone, if everyone is simultaneously looking at that, it says 42 no matter who's looking at it. And that's over time. And if it changes, then all of the viewers of that information, so it's simultaneous writers and simultaneous readers, if everyone's trying to write at it and everyone's trying to read at it at a given moment in time, 
Maybe a millisecond later it's different, but at a given moment in time everyone is seeing the same thing. And that's the consistency. When you make a change, it's isolated from the other changes. You might, you know, a one writer might set it to two and one minor writer a moment later set it to four. That's okay as long as it was two and then it was four. Not like two, four, two for a little while again, four for a little while, etc. And that's the that's the isolation that everything you do happens and then when it's done, it's done and it doesn't seem to move backwards in time. Durability just means that it, it's, it stays there. So base, which is the more uh, contrived, it's really eventual consistency is the, is the operative uh, concept here. Base means like it's, it's pretty much there. You know, it's not as picky as the acid and uh, state is soft, uh, I don't know. But eventual consistency means that if there is a value somewhere in this blob of stuff of X in it, and somebody sets it, to, somebody sets it to one, and everyone looks at it, and it's a one, and then somebody sets it to two for a while. Who, depending on who's looking at it, it might either be a one or a two, but then eventually it's a two. Okay, so if you wait long enough, this system will sort of percolate the change from the one to the two through everywhere, and all of the readers will eventually see the two. It's not that it's not consistent, it's that eventually it's consistent. It's not guaranteed to be consistent. And so you might be a reader, and you might say, what is it? It's a one. What is it? It's a two. And then you might even ask again, what is it? And it get a one. But eventually, after like five minutes, it's a two. Okay, so that's the basic idea. And so here is a diagram of this where we have one writer that's going to, this X has a value of 42 inside of the, the black box that is a database. By the way, even though some of you may be colorblind, this is in red and blue for uh, acid and base, but the color doesn't mean anything. It's just kind of cute. So we've got a value inside of the system of X, which has a value, of course, of 42. And then, um, oh, here comes a dog. Hi, dog. Are you just listening and hearing me give lectures and so you decide to come in? Okay. You can lay down there for a while. Sorry, that was my dog. Hey, Shelby, how are you doing? I have to put a picture in of you, how cute you are. So I start giving a lecture and the dog decides to come in. Um, and so here we go. We've got one writer that's going to set it to 10 and one's going to set it to 20 simultaneously, meaning they're just racing towards this data. And you've got a set of readers that are asking, what is the current value of X? and they're seeing 42 at this point. The writers have not done anything. And so what happens at some point is the database decides, probably by arrival or anything, it doesn't matter because it, it, these two things don't know what time it is, but at some point it picks something and it sets, it says, okay, this, this transaction is gonna happen. And it, while it's making those changes and to the extent where it has to inform all the readers, it says, I'm blocking the X equals 10. For as long as it's gonna take, until everyone who reads it is going to see a 20, meaning that you're watching it, it's 10, 10, 10, I mean, 42, 42, 42, 20. And it stays 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. It doesn't go 42, 20, 42, 20. It, 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 it's consistent. When it changes to 20, it changes to 20 and doesn't bounce back and forth. And then once that is finished, it's not like we're prohibiting it from ever being changed again. We just then let that one through. And then the readers, whatever it has to do so that everyone sees it 20, 20, 20, 20, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, not 20, 10, 20, 10. Okay, so you get it. So that's ACID and it's all about sort of like setting this barrier and stopping transactions from coming in once a transaction has made it into kind of the inner circle of this thing and putting up this little wall that stops things from coming in. The key to base or eventual consistency systems is they are much more scalable because they spread the data out using many copies, right? They're replicated. And this is the, oh, don't replicate. The whole idea of don't replicate is so that that acid can work, right? So if you have one number, it's really one place in the database and it's not 42 places. But if you have multiple servers, you could have a thousand different servers and have a thousand copies of X. And then your readers can like just read willy nilly, right? Your readers can read willy nilly. So the thing we've introduced here in this base style is we have kind of a timestamp. And so we have many copies of X, we have three copies of X of value 42 at time zero, right? Now the key thing here is this is eventually consistent. X has been 42 for a long time and all the copies of X are 42 and all the copies of X are 42 at time zero. 
So no matter how many readers you have, you say, what's X? They're all going to see 42. Okay, they're all going to see 42. Now, in's coming in is racing. There's multiple riders that are going to try to set X to 10 and set X to 20. Now, the key is, is that in a base style database, they, any of these systems can be the one that receives the request to change X to 10. And so it changes its copy of X to 10. But it also has to mark the time that it happened because you're going to see because we got racing happen, right? So we set X to 10 and we know that X in this middle system is 10 at time 1. And so if, if you're asking now what is X, well depending on which of those three systems you see, you might see 42 or you might see 10 or you might see 42. And if you ask again, you don't, if you keep asking and we're sort of stop this in time, you might see, oh, 40, it's 42. Oh, let us ask again. It's 10. Oh, no, it's not. I ask again. It's 42. So this is the inconsistent moment where, depending on the reader, the same reader, now if it's kind of cached and sticky and all that, you might see it not change. But the point is, is you technically could see in the outside world of watching, X is either 42 or 10. And the and the 42 ones don't know that they're invalid at this point. Now they're like if there was a cache, there'd be invalidation. We can't afford that kind of coordination at this point. We can't get them all simultaneously to change because there's 10,000 of them, right? They're all over the internet and there's 10,000 of them. We'll get there. So at this point, X is in an inconsistent state. Different viewers will see different values of X. One viewer can see X flipping back and forth between two values. And then the next thing that happens is actually before anything else happens, X equals 20 finds its way to another server. And it's not going to that same server because there's 10,000 of them. And so the second server, the third server at the bottom now has X with a value of 20 at time two. Now we're done here. And so the problem is, is that if you're a viewer, you might see 42 or 10 or 20 and a single viewer might see it sort of flipping between 10, 20, and 42. You're just like, what is it? Oh, it's 42, it's 10, it's 20, it's 42, it's 10, it's 20. It could go back and forth because again, the routing of the read requests might go to any of these three while it's in this inconsistent state. We paused it and it's in an inconsistent state and away we go. But we got to fix it because we do have to have eventual consistency. So more time passes and the middle server says, you know what, I'm going to start telling everybody about my great news that uh, I have a new value for X at time one and it sends it to the bottom server and it's like, well, sorry, Mr. Middle Server, you we have a time two value, so you're no good. So we'll just throw away your requested update. It's like, oh, okay. And at this point, again, we have a three possible values of X at any given moment. And then uh, the middle server decides to talk to the server, which had a 42 at time zero. And it's like, yeah, 10 at time one is way better than 42. So it's getting less inconsistent in that you can only see the value at this moment of 10 and 20. And of course you can guess what's gonna happen is that the bottom one wakes up and decides time to forward all my data to all my close, my 10,000 closest friends connected on the internet. So it goes to the first one, which has got 10 at one. It's like, well, 20 at two is better because it's later. And that one updates it. We still are inconsistent. And now we communicate between the third server and the second server and all of the data. And this happens, you know, 10,000 times or whatever. And so this is eventually consistent. Now, for now, from time going forward, you no matter how many times you ask and no matter how uh, many servers you end up touching in the asking, X is now 20 and it's going to stay 20. And so the question really is, how long did it take while the value of X was inconsistent? And so you can kind of say, really? Is that the big deal if it's going to take a half a second or five seconds or 10 seconds? Do we really care? And what if your data is so widely spread that it's not just an X, it's like 100,000 X's and everyone's looking at different ones. So eventual consistency is not entirely all bad. It is bad if it's a bank, right? Because eventually something bad is going to happen. Right, so it is bad for a bank. So database software basically works hard to meet sort of its semantic rules. So you have this atomic, right, which in a moment in time, it's always consistent. Things like Oracle, Postgres, MySQL, SQL, IDA, SQL Server, are all kind of classic ACID based. And then the eventual consistency are things like Mongo, Cassandra, 
and uh, Google's Big Table, and many others, right? And so basically, this is the this is the compromise. And the idea is is that you can scale these base systems far higher, especially with in read mostly. And literally, almost all database work is is read mostly. Although we'll talk a bit about uh, sort of write write writes as much, if not more, as, than reads sometimes. Those databases are a little bit different. But, uh, and so it, it seems like it's a pretty small compromise. But when you're dealing with like membership and classes and grades and money and stuff like that, it actually is a big deal. And it turns out you spend way too much time in the application recovering from possible errors that are actually rare in base style systems. But you still got to go like, hmm, I just created a new account at uh, csev at umich.edu. Okay, hang on, let's wait a second. And this is actually kind of cool, like in account creation. When you say, I'd like to make a new account, what's the first thing they do? They send you an email to verify you're an account. So your account is actually in a, is not even made yet. And, and what happens is, is think about what happens is if you ask to make an account, to make an account in one browser, with a, an email address, then make the account in another browser an email address, and then you get these emails and you click. So, that's the kind of thing to think about about consistency. Now, most systems, when they do new accounts, will have a little relational database just for new account creation, even if they're a fully uh, no SQL slash base uh, kind of a system. So there are uh, some compromises. Uh, one of the primary cool features of ACID style uh, databases is serial integer keys, but you don't do that. In base style, you actually generate what's called a global unique identifier that's a combination of random numbers and the current time that are carefully constructed to be global. And then that becomes kind of your primary key. Um, they're longer, but they're not terrible. If you, um, like in Postgres, there's a pretty efficient storage for GUIDs. Um, transactions uh, ensure that uh, on an ACID, I mean, ACID-based database that you're not getting stale data and you just have to have retry loops in your application in case there might be stale data and deal with the fact that you've got two new account requests from the same person because they talked to different servers when they started. Uh, unique constraints are difficult. Again, uh, you, in an in, in a ACID database, you can say insert CSEV, uh, on conflict do nothing, or on conflict ignore, on, uh, on conflict uh, update. So those that's when unique constraints are triggering. In base, you got none because you just don't know. You're talking to one of 10,000 servers, and there's no way for them to contact all other ones. You have to insert it and then find a way to recover when you turn out to have inserted the same record. There's no uniqueness. Um, and one of the things we do when we're dealing with ACID databases is we build beautiful queries. We join a bunch of things. We, we sort of give this beautiful query. We hand it. We optimize it. We get the index just right. And then we get a little tiny bit of data back, and it's exactly the data that we want. You tend to sort of like say, you know what, I got 10,000 servers. Let's just hit them all and see what happens and then throw away the stuff we don't want. And we'll see sort of applications that use this type of uh, base eventual consistency system uh, with a bunch of retrieve and throw away uh, methodology. So the next thing I want to talk about is the difficulty of scaling relational databases and why it is that we turn to something else as we tried to scale relational databases probably starting, you know, 20 years ago.